We don't learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. This quote is often attributed to John Dewey. And it's probably one of my favorites in education. And it's one of the reasons I love doing the podcast, talking to educators, different people in different fields, talking about some of the things that they struggled with and how they learn from that and what actually, how it, how it made them grow. I've talked about this in my personal journey with my weight loss. Uh, I try to share the things that I've, um, you know, kind of learned from in education, how I've grown from that too. And I always try to point at my own growth and learning to hopefully inspire others. And I think it's really important to do that as educators, not only for our colleagues, but for our students. Because a lot of times students just see you as getting to a space that you are just there And they don't see that you've also struggled. You've also had times where you've had to learn and grow. And that's why I was really excited to talk to Dr. Julie Warner uh, about her new book. uh, And it's called Failure Before Success, Teachers Describe What They Learn From Mistakes. And in this conversation, we talk about some of the things that we've learned from our growth. Uh, We share some uh, different words that I didn't know because Dr. Warner is a former English teacher who now works at the federal level in the United States government uh, and and within education. I really enjoyed the podcast. I hope that you can learn about um, some of the things that she shares in this, but also take the time to reflect on where have I grown? What have I learned from some of the mistakes and how has it actually made me better? And think about how you share some of that growth with your students, with your colleagues, because I think sometimes they just see how we got to an end point, but they don't see the process, which I think is the most important part. I really enjoyed this podcast. I hope you will too. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And today I have a special guest, Dr. Julie Warner. And we were having a conversation before uh, we started the podcast in a really interesting career in the work that you actually do, uh, going from teaching in the classroom, now working for the federal government. And one of the reasons we're having uh, Dr. Warner on today uh, is that uh, she and a group of uh of authors actually has a new book out called Failure Before Success, Teachers Describe What They Learn From Mistakes. And I'm really interested in this talk topic. I've talked about it not only in the professional side, uh, but also in some of my personal journeys as well. Because I think uh, when we focus just on the failure part, I think we're kind of short selling ourselves and our students, but really the resiliency developing from uh, where we grow is something that I am really fascinated in. I think it's tr- helped tremendously my career, uh, my work in education and the work that I do, uh, and and honestly, my personal life as well. So Dr. Warner, thank you so much for taking the time to be on here today. It's been great to kind of just learn more about you as we're going. So can you just tell people um, a little bit about your career path, who you are, and uh, what you do today? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I started my career back in 2004 with a uh, undergrad in education and went right into the teaching force as a baby, you know, in your Mm -hmm. early 20s when you know nothing about (laughs) what's going to happen to you next. (laughs) But uh, I I taught high school English for a few years and then left to pursue my doctorate in education. I had been really interested in technology and education. And it was around the time when internet was being leveraged mm-hmm. in the classroom, but not fully. You know, you had those couple computers in the back of the room and everybody was too afraid to touch them with their students yet. Right. And so I, I did, you know, about six or seven years of study on that topic and put out a book uh, back in 2016 on Uh, what I learned there about teenagers and technology. And um, from there, kind of pivoted and took a left turn into the federal government. Wasn't something I had seen myself doing (laughs) originally, but um, I got really interested at that point, having come from the classroom and seen it from that level. And then as an education researcher and really kind of going into classrooms and taking that ethnographic perspective on what's happening. I got really interested in pursuing the policy piece of the puzzle. And little did I know that entering in on to the policy sphere, I was going to get to have experience in the White House, in the Senate, and also on the executive branch side in the Department of Education. So I've had this really interesting opportunity to see 
education issues from a lot of different perspectives. Um, now I'm still in the federal government, but not in an education focused role. I'm doing data science work, but um, I'm still doing a lot of writing in the education space and do some freelance writing on various education topics for different online outlets. It's interesting that you're talking about, um, well, it's interesting that you're interested in policy because, <laughs> because uh, like when that's probably one of the things that, you know, I think a lot of people actually hate in education and some of that red tape and stuff like that. So, I, but I think obviously it's important that, you know, especially at all government levels and we have a, a different education system. Like we don't actually have like a federal department of education in Canada, right? It's all, um, provincial state, you know, uh, kind of controlled, but, uh, a lot of times when you see the, some of the policies that, um, it could be really good. It's like, do those actions, like what, what is said and what is aligned are, 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 are kind of interesting uh, to do that. So like, that's a really fascinating, uh, take to go. Cause you know, no one goes into high school English thinking they're going to be, <laughs> you know, working. Well, maybe you do like work in the Senate, like that, like how, yeah. how, how did that just like, you're just like walking one day and somebody said, Hey, <laughs> you should come well, work in DC. Like, did you grow up in DC too or no? No, no, I did. And I grew up in Atlanta, Okay, but yeah, I, I had always taken the perspective, you know, you just close your door and mm -hmm. you do what you're going to do, no matter what the policies yeah. stated necessarily, because there, there typically wasn't a way to satisfy what they're asking for. And right. frankly, I didn't agree with a lot of it. I, I would read different policies and curriculum mm -hmm. mandates that would come out. And I would say, this doesn't reflect what's happening in my classroom. This just, just isn't going to work with my students. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I took kind of an adversarial sort of perspective <laughs> with regard to policy in the federal government. It was like, stay out of my classroom. You know, right. what do you know about what I do? You really don't. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then, and that's, and now you're making that policy and it's, it's good to know that there, well, I don't know. I don't know if you're making that policy, but obviously you have, you know, some bearing in the process of um, what you're doing. I'm going to ask you, I didn't know this, and you kind of alluded to it. You wrote a book in 2016, because that's not what we were going to talk about today. So what was the book was about technology teenagers? Like, can you give us a, like a quick synopsis of what that was and what it was about? Yeah, yeah. I was really interested in the out of school literacy practices mm -hmm. of students. You would see students that would fail your English class, but you knew they were these prolific writers in other contexts. And I started to wonder, what is that disconnect? Is there anything that we can learn from looking closely at what students are motivated to do on their own in the realm of literacy outside of school? And so what I ended up doing was following three teenagers for almost two years, sitting first in their English class and kind mm -hmm. of watching what their academic life was like, interviewing their teacher, looking closely at their curriculum materials. And then they gave me permission to follow their social media accounts and different interactivity that they engaged in online. And so I was kind of, you know, comparing notes. What, what can you really learn about mm -hmm. what kids are doing? So, so it's actually like, um, really one of the questions that, so I asked this in innovators mindset and I'm curious, and this is like, was actually a, question that was meant to be targeted towards high school English teachers. So now that I have someone who taught that. So one of the questions I asked is like, when you're teaching kids, what is more important to teach them how to write an essay or how to write a blog post? And the question was, um, like, I remember actually someone saying, uh, I guess a block. And I was like, so why do, are you saying that? Cause you think that's my answer, right? And they're like, well, and they're, and they're talking about kind of like the structures of essays, things like that. And they're like, well, I think an essay because of going to college. I'm like, yeah, but not all kids go to college. Right. And then I said, you know, like, what about, you know, these elements, of blog posts, like embedding media, bringing in links, like little things like that. Some of the, some of the stuff that I read, uh, like I would read a blog post. I wouldn't read necessarily high school essays because of the structure. They're sometimes meant to be boring. And then the person said, and I remember this. I guess, you know, it, like, I actually think it's important to teach both. That's what they said to me. I said, that's what I think too. Do you do that? And they're like, oh, and it was like kind of interesting because it wasn't meant to be like, you should be teaching blogs. It's like, what are some of the elements of like, 
the world that we live in currently, not the ki- that our kids live in, because we actually live in the same world, right? We, we don't go to Mars at night, you know, the adults, but it's kind of understanding that. And there's a, I don't know what you think about this, and I'm curious your thoughts. Um, David Crystal, I think that's his name. He talked about yeah. that actually kids uh, could, uh, are reading and writing more than uh, previous generations. And just a really simple analogy, and I'm pretty sure he said this, but if you think about it, like, when did you read, write, and walk at the same time as a kid, right? And kids do it all the time, right? Adults do it all yeah. the time too. And the the analogy is, uh, you know, like people will get mad at like using OMG and LOL, but it is language. And it actually is something that's developed. And he, um, one of the things, I don't know if this is a generational thing. I, you graduated 2004. I graduated uh, university in 1999 is the term scuba i don't do you know what scuba stands for do you know i can't remember i do i do know it's an acronym right it's an acronym but like most people don't know that and they don't remember it and it actually stands for i'm going to see if this is a generational if we're like even close to the same age so it stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus so that's what it stands for the only reason i know that is because on family ties with michael j fox they had to do a test and they're like self-contained. And I remember that the only reason is because I watched a show in the eighties that I knew that yeah. was a, was an acronym. Right. So it wasn't like taught in school or, but it's just like, so in our vernacular that many people don't know that. So like, it's, so like when you saw that, um, that connection between like literacy, um, did you find like the students were actually quite literate, but just, it was like not a context they were using in school. Like how, what did that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, going back to your your question that that you'd posed about mm-hmm. blog posts versus essay, I mean, I think it's all functional, right? That's what's mm-hmm. important to me as a teacher. I would say like, you know, what context are you going to need to write in? Mm-hmm. And what are what context are you interested in learning to write in? Uh, most of the most of the li- like what I would characterize as literacy events or literacy skills that I have, I picked up through engagement. Mm-hmm. And I picked them up kind of because they were ambient, right? They're in the spaces in which I engage. Right. I don't think most of them were taught to me in any rote or direct way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's what the kids were really doing. They're picking up on how to respond to the audiences in the spaces where they were interacting, what the formats and forms of the different Mm -hmm. types of communication were. And it's really learned through that social engagement with their peers. And I was thinking, you know, this could translate. You don't want to take and kind of colonize kids out of school literacy practices. There's nothing more off-putting than that, like for a high school student. Um, But, you know, looking at, okay, if social engagement works to teach literacy skills, how can we foster that in the classroom? Yeah, I think that's such a, like the, um, the thing that I say to people is that I don't really think you have to teach keyboarding classes anymore and those all my kids don't type blah 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 and i said well have you ever taught like a keyboarding class on a a phone and they're like no i said but do you see how fast kids are because they actually care right and it's part of the context it's part of the connection so a lot of a lot of the, the the reason behind that now i don't have like you know research on this or anything like that but like other than what i see with my eyes kids can just fly through this stuff because they care what they're doing. But then, uh, you know, like the fox jump over the brown hat or whatever, that's not, you know, that's not going to get kids excited about writing. And then they start like doing this on a computer or whatever. But when they text their friends, you know, like being fast is a way to stay in the conversation. So it, it, I, I appreciate that you say that because it is different context, right? Like how I write to a friend, write to my brother versus how I write a blog post versus write an email to someone I don't know. Those are all different things. I, I know how to kind of switch in and out, but it's like a lot of the things that we teach in, you know, a traditional, not a bad, but a traditional English class are really important in that facet. But there's also these other spaces too, where kids connect. What, what's the title? What's the title of that book? I actually, I'm like, I'm interested in, in reading this. I, I, I didn't, this is like yeah. a surprise. This is a surprise bonus of this episode because I didn't <laughs> know you wrote this. What's it called? Yeah, it's called Adolescents New Literacies with and through mobile phones. Oh wow. Okay. So like anyone that's listening, if you check it out in the links, it's I'm assuming it's on available on Amazon. 
Oh yeah. Okay, so it will be in the link. So yeah, that's bo- bonus app. Bo- I was not <laughs> expecting this. So like, I did, you didn't tell me any of this stuff. So uh, that is a bonus. So you get the bonus <laughs> bonus book uh, chat. Okay, so let's talk about your your new book. And um, at the time we're recording this, it's not available, but it will be uh, by the time this is actually posted. So again, if you look in the links, uh, you'll see this. And the title of the book is failure before success, teachers describe what they learn from mistakes. And I know that you wrote part of this book, but you actually brought in um, other authors, other people that shared stories and collaboration. So can can you give us like just a quick synopsis of, of what the book is about? Yeah, yeah. And I think this kind of connects to something that you mentioned earlier, you know, how do you go from being a classroom teacher and just mm-hmm. figure out sort of how to write a piece of legislation? Well, the answer was I I didn't. I right, didn't right, right? Right. <laughs> again, you know, that ambient like knowledge that you pick up through interacting with people on the job or in mm-hmm. whatever context you're in and you just soak it all up, right? And it's kind of a high stakes environment, so you know, the pressure's on to to figure it out. But that was where the idea for the book came. I had gone and gotten my Senate badge and it you know, there it is hot off the press and I'm looking at it and I'm like seeing my face there and going <laughs> Okay, whoa, how am I going to figure right. this out? Like, I could still remember vividly being a high school teacher and living that life. And it was like a total 360 wow. trying to figure out, you know, what the policy piece even meant. And I thought, you know what? I've done so many different things now in the education space and I had to figure it out on the fly. I, I think that. I didn't realize that everybody makes mistakes. Everybody's learning every day. And if you're not ever confused or you're not ever messing up, where is the growth there? Mm -hmm. Because I think you have to be confused before you can have an understanding by definition. Right. Yeah. And that, that, sorry, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. And so I put the call out, um, online and just asked for contributions on Mm. mistake making in the classroom and really for teachers to describe some critical incident where they'd messed up. It could be big. It could be small. And then to talk about how they actually made that into something fruitful. Mm -hmm. How did, what did they learn and how? Yeah. And so like, when you like, can you, do you have an example of like one of the stories that was shared, like from a classroom, like what, what they actually had talked about? Yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're so diverse. It's really interesting. Um, I had one contribution from a former teacher of the year, state teacher of the year, who had, she was a white teacher and had gone to teach on an Indian reservation. Mm -hmm. And she just admits that she had no idea what she was doing. Um, She had picked up a book for the students to read that, (laughs) <laughs> put forward really essentialized notions of Native American people, right. had a lot of uh, mischaracterizations and bad information. She ran it by one of her colleagues and they were just like, you cannot right. do this. She was embarrassed and realized like, okay, wait, the way that I think about schooling is from the perspective of a white person in the U.S. And this, the perspective of my students and what my students are going to be interested in what they're going to need is vastly different from what I know from my vantage point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we were talking about that in the podcast before, um, that notion of empathy. And I think that for me is, um, I I talk a lot about the notion of like learner driven evidence informed practice. And really it's, it's like you hear this big push and it's actually from a lot, a lot of time it's actually pushed from government. I'm not saying you specifically making the policies doing that, but like the notion of the notion of data driven actually doesn't understand, like isn't really focused on stories. It actually changes kids like personalities into numbers. Right. And really kind of like understanding who your kids are working backwards from that point um, and, and kind of going from their perspectives actually can create a much better learning experience. And I, I think, you know, uh, I was in a point in my career and I think this is I, I, I re- the, one of the reasons I, I love this is because. Uh, like, and I was really interested in this book is because a lot of times what I do to kind of, um, show my learning is show mistakes that I made. Right. And, and I think, uh, a lot of times 
teachers see their principals as infallible because we don't talk about the struggles we have. Um, kids say the same things as teachers. They just, teachers just got there magically, knew everything. And like, they, they, they don't see that process of learning. And uh, when I first started teaching and I kind of like, I felt like I was kind of influenced by my teachers. It was like, you will learn the way I teach. You will adapt to me. Like that, that was my perspective, right? Like that, you know, I'm the teacher, I'm the boss. That's how it works. But, um, you know, as I progressed and understood my career, it's like, well, they're not really connecting with me. It's kind of like bragging, like nobody passed my class. Well, then probably not a really good teacher, right? If nobody passes, <laughs> right. like it's, it's probably more of a you thing than anything, right? But really kind of switching my lens uh, and really, okay, who are these kids? What are their experiences and knowing them? Like one of the things I'm really passionate about, I have two daughters and um, already my one daughter is like, just is about to turn one. She'll be one at the time of this podcast. Uh, my other daughter's both turn five. And even though they grew up in the same family, they have a lot of the same experiences. They're very different. And so I expect mm -hmm. you to know, I expect you not to just, you know, well, you know, they're the Kuros kids and just paint them with the same brush. They're going to have different beliefs, experiences, uh, ways like one's very talkative, one's very shy. And I think it's because the other one's so talkative and it, it's kind of, it's just kind of interesting. And I think, you know, that's, I, I appreciate you sharing that because I think it is um, so important in that process. Like when you talked about it, you know, when you move from, uh, when you move from your, you know, teaching position to like a government position, what are some of the like, struggles that you had and like how what did you learn from that and how is it like is do you do you feel that there's things that you would wish you could have done as a teacher that because of what you learned in this role oh man um things i wish i would have learned as a this, teacher this I is think, where you get hard-hitting questions the interview yeah, mindset podcast, right? yeah i mean i I almost want to turn that question on its head and just say that when I was on the job in the policy space, mm -hmm. I was needing to tap back into my classroom experience yeah. over and over again and kind of battle test the, the different policies that, that we were making. Um, you know, there, I was involved with some stuff on teacher uh, measurement, teacher evaluation, and, you know, just knowing what I know from teaching, I knew that you can't reduce what we do down to numbers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's just one of many examples where, you know, you kind of had to, to tap back, tap into that and think back um, what's really, what's important for what teachers do every single day. You can't think of an, a universal kind of policy without thinking how that's going to apply to what teachers do on the job. Yeah. And, and it's good. It's good because I think a lot of times, um, I know, can I, can I ask you, um, the, what, what's the current secretary, uh, education, sec sorry, secretary of education, uh, is uh, it Cardona? Yeah. Is it Dr. Miguel? Is it Miguel Cardona? Yeah. Cause yeah. he was actually a superintendent. And I think that, um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe this is just a Canadian thing. I kind of think that matters that you actually were involved in education when you're making these decisions. And I don't think like, I, I understand there's like politics, right. And you serve, it's not, you only serve teachers. Um, but those perspectives, um, really, really matter. And a lot of like, it's even to the sense that you can see this in not just, um, administrators is that a lot of times there are decisions being made for classrooms uh, for schools or districts by people that are never present in those spaces that they don't really understand um, that some of the policies that are being created actually cause some of the issues, right? They kind of paint a picture of what they want, but they don't actually like address the realities of, of what can actually be created. And, uh, and it's interesting. So it's good to see um, that there's a focus on like more people from, from the, the, the profession kind of going, um, you know, into those spaces. Cause I think that's gonna, I, I think, I don't know, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I think it's not only helpful to teachers, right. Who are, you know, closest to children, but I also think it's helpful to everybody. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of my colleagues there were economists and so, you know, you mm -hmm. can do all that modeling, you can do a lit review, mm -hmm. but if you don't know how a policy is going to trickle down and have right. an effect 
all the way down the line, you know, it's, it's pretty useless. And as you said, it couldn't even be deleterious. Mm -hmm. So. Hey, so when you got it, what is, that's like, you just threw an English teacher word out to me. What was that word? <laughs> that's, that's how I, that's my roots right there. What, what, what was that? What did you say? <laughs> deleterious. It could, De it could hurt. Deleterious. That is like, that's my new word. New word day. <laughs> Never, see, and like that, that is, I could have just, I could have just kept going. Pretended I knew what you're talking about. <laughs> nope. I'm like, I have, I've never heard that word before. I, I want you to, uh, I want you to write a poem and rhyme that. That's That would be the, yeah. that would be the next, uh, maybe like a English assignment is like use deleterious in a poem. Right. And it now you. I've, I've realized that I've messed myself up by saying that. Stop it. <laughs> I don't know okay. if I can handle that assignment. Hey, if you could go back, um, so with your, with your role now, and you could go back to the classroom, right? And I don't know if that's ever in the cards for you, if that's something you might be interested in, but let's just say you're doing that. What is something that you might do different that you've learned because of this work? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. So I, I had that it's, opportunity. It was a deleterious question. Where was it? Did I use that <laughs> right? Hopefully, hopefully not. <laughs> All right. No, I hope it wasn't a deleterious question. But I had. Uh, I had the Sorry, I just I learned back. a new word today. I just want to start throwing it around, right? So. Yeah, yeah. You got to use it, or you're going to lose it. That's right. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I, I apologize. I was so excited about that word. I hope okay. it doesn't mean like a swear and you're just tricking me. Like it means something no, really no, horrible. No. Okay. No, no, no. So what would you, so sorry, what would you go like now that from what you know in your current job, what would you change in, in your work? Um, yeah, I think that I would, I would advocate on my own behalf as a teacher more often. I did not realize when I was a classroom teacher that I could do more than just complain to my colleagues about right. what was going on. Uh, and, you know, working on the Hill, I learned that how lobbying works, how advocacy works, mm -hmm. education groups would come in, including teachers and, you know, give me a really strong um, position to take for whatever upcoming piece of legislation was mm -hmm. coming on the pipe. We have agency as teachers yeah. to affect change. And that was not something I realized. I thought that was for people with more experience, people who were more important than me. Um, I didn't realize the value of my voice and the mechanisms that existed to advocate for teachers and by proxy our students. So I'm, I'm just, I'm curious on your thoughts on this because um, I, I really appreciate what you just said. And one of the things I hear is like, oh, the system. I'm like, like, it's like, what's the system? Like, what do you mean by that? Right. Cause I, I think a lot of times it's like, well, I am in it. So am I not part of the system? Right. So, uh, obviously I wrote like innovates at the box and it was like talking about like, Hey, we work within constraints and education and you can still do incredible things within constraints. But I think part of it too, is that sometimes when you do those incredible things within those constraints, you actually change the constraints. Right. I think that's that's part of it, too, because, as you said, I think it is really important that um, we actually kind of go through and advocate while we're changing these things. And uh, Katie Novak, who's you know, I've worked on uh, with uh, she's publishing a book right away with um, our company. I, I've written a book with her. She said this to me, and I think it really ties to your point that a year this year for kids in grade three, this is it. This is their one year in grade three. So of course we need to continuously push and, and make education better for every single person, but also do everything we can to make sure this is the best experience for the kids in front of you. Because sometimes, you know, those, we want to change policy. We want like this mass change, but that does, you know, take time. It takes effort, but that doesn't really help the kids in front of you right now. And it's like, I, I don't know. I, I, when I used to go to like, when I used to go to my high school after I graduated, I always would see like, how come they got a new gym? How come they got this stuff? Like, where was the stuff when I was there? I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's a Canadian thing, but it's like, how come all no, the good stuff I, came after I left? I taught at the high school that I went to. And so I had a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> They're in a state of the art building with all kinds of accoutrement at that point. And I'm going, we didn't have this computer lab. We didn't have, you know, that that's uh accoutrement there you go that's another word but 
I I know that one's that's French, right? You're doing that for the for the. I did it. You just assumed Canadian. I'm Canadian that I would know that yeah. right away. Perfect. Okay, so exactly. for the Canadian accoutrement, that in there. accoutrement. This is like uh, I I would just so you know, if I would never play Scrabble against you. You. Uh, you well, in Scrabble, you win if you know all the little tiny words like Q I. So, well, th- now that you just English. made it worse, there's no way I'm playing it now. I didn't. <laughs> so I, obviously, my strategy has been terribly wrong. So, like English teachers are notoriously <laughs> bad at Scrabble. We're like trying to think of the big words, and it's like it's all about the strategy. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the last question I'm going to ask you. Um, you, you talk about um, the the failure before success, and as I said, uh, Link is in uh, the book, and I I I, I am a big. I, I've learned, I, I think part of it too, is that you can learn from failure. You can actually learn from success. It's the growth part that's the most essential aspect of this. So uh, any teacher reading this, like what is the one big thing uh, that you hope for them to take away that will actually help them grow in their process from reading this book? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that I wrote this or conceived of this book with new teachers in mind, mm-hmm. you know, as as you talked about before, we don't often talk about our mistakes. They aren't typically visible. You'll see the published book in its end form, but you're not going to see all the drafts along the way. And I think that that does teachers, especially new teachers, a major disservice when we don't talk about our mistakes. We don't talk about all of the, all of the previous drafts and all the work that goes Mm -hmm. into whatever end product there is in our practice. Um, I assumed that I was the only one messing up. Mm -hmm. I was making mistakes constantly. I assumed it was just me and I was doing my best to hide that stuff because as a teacher, you're the authority in your classroom. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to know everything. If a student asks you a question, you don't know the answer to, you know, you've got, they got a little heart, a bit of a heart attack because you're like, (laughs) I can't lose control as the sage in the room or whatnot. Um, And of course, when you're being evaluated, you know, typically school leadership isn't that interested in hearing about how you messed up. They want to hear about your positive results. So I'm I'm really hoping that new teachers or any teacher that that reads this that hasn't already kind of come to that realization has increased Mm -hmm. self-compassion when you're when you're making mistakes, you know, knowing that all the expert people that you admire Mm -hmm. have done all of this stuff too. You know, it all looks a little bit different, but if you're actually a really expert teacher, I think that you've probably made a lot of mistakes because they're necessary for innovation Mm -hmm. and responsiveness. Um, and, And you have some sort of hopefully reflective practice where you're really thinking through what happens rather than, you know, we don't have a lot of time as right. teachers during the day to do that stuff, right. to do that kind of reflection. But I think the best teachers make time for it. And, and, you know, you, you, you utilize the term expert, right? Like the people that we look up to. And I think the reason that we look up to them is because they're willing to embrace mistakes. They're not just, not just like sit in them and do nothing from them, but to learn from that process yeah. and grow. So uh, I am so grateful that you took the time to be on the podcast. Uh, I, I wish you all the best on the, the release of your book. And uh, as I said, anyone who's interested, uh, just take a look in the links below, no matter where you're listening or watching this podcast, uh, you'll see it there. Dr. Warner, thank you so much uh, for for all that you do in education. And uh, any of the policies that we see coming out, we'll, we'll either thank or blame you. So. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that. It's been great. I really appreciate it. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful day.